Chapter One of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter One Foot Faring. It was a lovely morning in the first of summer. Donal Grant was descending a path on a hillside to the valley below a sheep track of which he knew every winding as well as any boy his half mile to and from school but he had never before gone down the hill with the feeling that he was not about to go up again he was on his way to pastures very new and in the distance only negatively inviting but his heart was too full to be troubled nor was his a heart to harbour a care the next thing to an evil spirit though not quite so bad for one care may drive out another while one devil is sure to bring in another a great billowy waste of mountains lay beyond him, amongst which played the shadow at their games of hide-and-seek, graciously merry in the eyes of the happy man, but sadly solemn in the eyes of him in whose heart the dreary thoughts of the past are at a like game. Behind Donal lay a world of dreams into which he dared not turn and look, yet from which he could scarce avert his eyes. He was nearing the foot of the hill when he stumbled and almost fell, but recovered himself with the agility of a mountaineer, and the unpleasant knowledge that the sole of one of his shoes was all but off. Never had he left home for college that his father had not made personal inspection of his shoes to see that they were fit for the journey, but on this departure they had been forgotten. He sat down and took off the failing equipment. It was too far gone to do anything temporary with it, and of discomforts a loose sole to one's shoe in walking is of the worst. The only thing was to take off the other shoe and both stockings and go barefoot. He tied all together with a piece of string, made them fast to his deerskin knapsack, and resumed his walk. The thing did not trouble him much. To have what we want is riches, but to be able to do without is power. To have shoes is a good thing. To be able to walk without them is a better. But it was long since Donal had walked barefoot, and he found his feet, like his shoe, "'weaker in the soul than was pleasant. "'It's time,' he said to himself "'when he found he was stepping gingerly. "'I gave my feet a turn at the old accomplishment. "'It's a pity to grow not so fit for anything "'sooner nor you need. "'I would like to lie down at last with hard soles. "'In every stream he came to he bathed his feet, "'and often on the way rested them "'when otherwise able enough to go on. "'He had no certain goal, "'though he knew his direction and was in no haste.' He had confidence in God and in his own powers as the gift of God, and knew that wherever he went he needed not be hungry long, even should the little money in his pocket be spent. It is better to trust in work than in money. God never buys anything, and is forever at work. But if anyone trusts in work, he has to learn that he must trust in nothing but strength, the self-existent original strength only. And Donald Grant had long begun to learn that. The man has begun to be strong who knows that, separated from life essential, he is weakness itself, that one with his origin, he will be of strength inexhaustible. Donal was now descending the heights of youth to walk along the king's high road of manhood. Happy he who, as his son is going down behind the western, is himself ascending the eastern hill, returning through old age to the second and better childhood, which shall not be taken from him. He who turns his back on the setting sun goes to meet the rising sun. He who loses his life shall find it. Donal had lost his past, but not so as to be ashamed. There are many ways of losing. His past had but crept, like the dead, back to God who gave it. In better shape it would be his by and by. Already he had begun to foreshadow this truth. God would keep it for him. He had set out before the sun was up for he would not be met by friends or acquaintances. Avoiding the well-known farmhouses and occasional village, he took his way up the river, and about noon came to a hamlet where no one knew him, a cluster of straw-roofed cottages, low and white, with two little windows each. He walked straight through it, not meaning to stop, but spying in front of the last cottage a rough stone seat under a low, wide-spreading elder tree, was tempted to sit down and rest a little. The day was now hot, and the shadow of the tree inviting. He had but seated himself when a woman came to the door of the cottage, looked at him for a moment, and, probably thinking him from his bare feet, poorer than he was, said, 
What do you like to drink? Ay, would I, answered Donal. A drink of water, gin you please. What for no milk? asked the woman. Cause I'm able to pay for it, answered Donal. I want na payment, she rejoined, perceiving his drift as little as probably my reader. And I want na milk, returned Donal. Well, ye may pay for it gin ye like, she rejoined. But I dinna like, replied Donal. Well, you're a some queer customer, she remarked. I thank you, but I'm no customer. Sit for a drink of water, he persisted, looking in her face with a smile. And water is I been gratis, sin the days of Adam. Sit maybe in tones in the hut parts of the world. The woman turned into the cottage, and came out again presently with a delft basin, holding about a pint full of milk, yellow and rich. There, she said, drink and be thankful. I'll be thankful on drunken, said Donal. I thank you with all my heart, but I cannot bide to take for nothing what I can pay for, and I dinna like to lay out my silver upon a luxury I can weel enough do wantin, for I had no muckle. I wouldna be shabby, nor yet greedy. Drink, for the love of God, said the woman. Donal took the bowl from her hand and drank till all was gone. Will you have a drap mare? she asked. Na, no a drap, answered Donal. I'll gang in the strength of that ye given me. Maybe no just forty days, good wife, but mare no forty minutes, and that's a good part of a day. I thank ye heartily. Yon was a milk of human kindness, gin ever was any. As he spoke, he rose and stood up refreshed for his journey. I have a soldier laddie away in the hep parts ye spake of, said the woman. Gin ye had na ta'en the milk, ye would a gin me a sad heart. Eh, good wife, it would a gin me one to think I had, returned Donal. The Lord gie you back your soldier laddie safe and sound. Maybe I'll have to gang after him, soldier myself. Na, na, that wouldna do. You're a scholar. That's easy to see, for all you're so plain spoken. It does a body's heart good to hear a man that understands things say them plain out in the tongue his mother taught him. Sick a one'll gang straight till his maker and find all thing there home like. Lord, I wish ministers would speak like other folk. You would say to please my mother saying that, remarked Donal. Ye maun be just sick another as her. Well, come in and sit ye down out o' the sun and have something to eat. Nah, I'll take na mare fra ye the day, and I thank ye, replied Donal. I canna well bide. What for no? It's not so muckle at a minute hurry as that a mon be doin. What are ye born for? Gin a body may speer. I'm goin to seek no my fortune, but my daily bread. Gin I spake as a right man, I would say I was goin to look for the work set me. I'm feared to say that straight out. I hanna won so far as that yet. I winna do nothing though it he wouldn't have me do. I dare to say that, so be I understand. My mother says the day'll come when I'll care for nothing but his will. Your mother'll be Janet Grant, I'm thinking. There cannot be two such in one countryside. You're in the right, answered Donal. Ken ye, my mither? I ha' seen her, and to see her is to ken her. Ay, gin who sees her be sick like as herself. I canna pretend to that, but she's well kent through all the country for a god fearing woman. And where'll ye be for the no? I'm just upon the tramp, looking for work. And what may ye be pleased to call work? Oh, just the communication o' what I ha the understanding of. Oh, well, gin ye'll condescend to advice frae an old wife, I'll give ye a bit with ye. Take na ilka lass ye see for a born angel. Mist out her a wee to begin with. Hang up your judgment of her a wee. Look to the mo and the ean o' her. I thank ye, said Donal with a smile, in which the woman spied the sadness. I'm no like to need the advice. She looked at him pitifully and paused. "'Gin you come this gate again,' she said, "'ye'll no gang by my door.' "'I will no,' replied Donal, and wishing her good-bye with a grateful heart, betook himself to his journey. He had not gone far when he found himself on a wide moor. He sat down on a big stone and began to turn things over in his mind. This is how his thoughts went. "'I can never be the man I was. The thought of my heart's taken from me.' I canna think about things as I used. There's nothing so bonny as afore. When the life slips from him, who can a man gang on living? Yet I'm not dead. That's what makes the difficulty of the situation. Gin I were dead, well, I canna what then. I doubt there would be trouble still, though some things might be lighter. But that's neither here nor there. I'm on live. I had no choice. I didna make myself, and I'm not going to meddle with myself. I think mare o' myself nor dar that. 
But there's one question I'm on settle for a gang farther, and that's this. Am I to be less or mair nor I was afore? It's agreed I canna be the same. If I canna be the same, I maun either be less or greater than I was afore. Wilka them is it to be? I winna have that question to spear mair nor once. I'll be mair nor I was. To sink to less would be to lose grip in my past as wills on my future. And how would I ever look her in the face gin I grew less because of her? A child like me let a bonny lassie think herself to blame for what I grew till. And there's a greater nor the last to be considered. Cause he sees no fit to give me her I would have. Is he not to have his will o' me? It's a grand thing to ken a lassie like yon, and a grander thing yet to be allowed to love her. To sit down and greet cause I'm not to marry her would be most ungrateful. What for should I threep but I ought to have her? What for should not I be disappointed as well as another? I have as good a right to any good it's to come o' that, I fancy. Gin it be a man's part to carry a sair heart, it canna be his part to sit down with it upon the roadside, and lay it upon his lap and grate o'er it, like a bairn with a cut it finger. He maun hold on his road. Who am I to differ for the lave o' my folk? I should be like the lave, and gin I greet, I win a gern. The Lord himself had to be cront with pain. Eh, my bonny dove, but ye love a better man, and that's a sair comfort. Gin it had been otherwise, I did not think I could have borne the pain at my heart. But as it's good, and not ill it's come to ye, I had now you and myself too to grate for, and that's a sair comfort. Lord, I'll climb to thee, and gather o' the healing it grows for the nations in thy garden. I see the thing as plain as thing can be. The cure o' all ills just mere life. That's it. Life a bone and a yomp the life it took the stroke. And gin through this heartbreak I come by mere life, It'll be just one of the throws of my heavenly birth. In the wilk the bairn has as many of the pains as the mither. That's maybe a differ between the two, the earthly and the heavenly. So now I had to begin fresh, and let the thing it's past and gone slip after ither dreams. Eh, hey, but it's a bonny dream yet. It lies close ahind me, not to be forgotten, not to be looked at. Like one of the dreams of water in moonlight, it has no work in them. A body wouldna lie on night and all day too in a dream of the soul's gloamin'. Now, Lord, make o' me a strong man, and sign and gimme as muckle o' the bonny as may please thee. Who am I to lip until, gin no to thee, my ain father and mother and grandfather and all body in one, for thou gids me them all? No, I am to begin again, a fresh life for this minute. I am to set out for this very point, like one of the youngest sons in the fairy tales, to seek my portion, and see what's coming to meet me as I gain to meet it. The world afore me is my story book. I canna see o'er the leaf till I come to the end of it. When I was a bairn, just able with sair endeavour to win at the heart o' print, I never would look on afore. The one time I did it, I thought I had done a shameful thing, like looking in at a keyhole, as I did just once too, when I thank God my mither gave me sick a blessed licking, and I kent it must be something dreadful I had done. So here's for what's coming. I ken where it maun come frae, and I shall make it welcome. My mither says the main mischief in the world is, it folk winna let the Lord have his own way, and saw so he has just to take it. Wilk makes it a sair thing for them. Therewith he rose to encounter that which was on its way to meet him. He is a fool who stands and lets life move past him like a panorama. He also is a fool who would lay hands on its motion and change its pictures. He can but distort and injure if he does not ruin them, and come upon awful shadows behind them. And lo, as he glanced around him, Already something of the old mysterious loveliness, now for so long vanished from the face of the visible world, had returned to it. Not yet as it was before, but with dawning promise of a new creation, a fresh beauty, in welcoming which he was not turning from the old, but receiving the new that God sent him. He might yet be many a time sad, but to lament would be to act as if he were wronged, would be at best weak and foolish. He would look the new life in the face, and be what it should please God to make him. The scents the wind brought him from field and garden and moor seemed sweeter than ever wind-borne scents before. They were seeking to comfort him. He sighed, but turned from the sigh to God, and found fresh gladness and welcome. The wind hovered about him as if it would fain have something to do in the matter. The river rippled and shone as if it knew something worth knowing as yet unrevealed. The delight of creation is verily in secrets but in secrets as truths on the way. All secrets are embryo revelations. On the far horizon, heaven and earth met as old friends, who, though never parted, were ever renewing their friendship. 
the world, like the angels, was rejoicing. If not over a sinner that had repented, yet over a man that had passed from a lower to a higher condition of life, out of its earth into its air. He was going to live above and look down on the inferior world. Ere the shades of evening fell that day around Donald Grant, he was in the new childhood of a new world. I do not mean such thoughts had never been present to him before, but to think a thing is only to look at it in a glass. To know it as God would have us know it, and as we must know it to live, is to see it as we see love in a friend's eyes, to have it as the love the friend sees in ours. To make things real to us is the end and the battle cause of life. We often think we believe what we are only presenting to our imaginations. The least thing can overthrow that kind of faith. The imagination is an endless help towards faith, but it is no more faith than a dream of food will make us strong for the next day's work. To know God as the beginning and end, the root and cause, the giver, the enabler, the love and joy and perfect good, the present one existence in all things and degrees and conditions, is life. And faith, in its simplest, truest, mightiest form, is to do his will. Donal was making his way towards the eastern coast, in the certain hope of finding work of one kind or another. He could have been well content to pass his life as a shepherd like his father, but for two things. He knew what it would be well for others to know, and he had a hunger after the society of books. A man must be able to do without whatever is denied him, but when his heart is hungry for an honest thing, he may use honest endeavor to obtain it. Donal desired to be useful and live for his generation, also to be with books. To be where was a good library would suit him better than buying books, for without a place in which to keep them they are among the impedimenta of life. And Donal knew that in regard to books he was in danger of loving after the fashion of this world. Books he had a strong inclination to accumulate and hoard, therefore the use of a library was better than the means of buying them. Books as possessions are also of the things that pass and perish, as surely as any other form of earthly having. They are of the playthings God lets men have that they may learn to distinguish between apparent and real possession. If having will not teach them, loss may. But who would have thought, meeting the youth as he walked the road with shoeless feet, that he sought the harbor of a great library in some old house, so as day after day to feast on the thoughts of men who had gone before him, for his was no antiquarian soul. It was a soul hungry after life, not after the mummy cloths and wrapping the dead. End of chapter 1《Chapter 2 of Donald Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 2 A Spiritual Footpad. He was now walking southward, but would soon, when the mountains were well behind him, turn toward the east. He carried a small wallet, filled chiefly with oat cake and hard skim milk cheese. About two o'clock he sat down on a stone and proceeded to make a meal. A brook from the hills ran near, for that he had chosen the spot his fare being dry. He seldom took any other drink than water. He had learned that strong drink at best, but discounted to him his own at a high rate. He drew from his pocket a small thick volume he had brought as the companion of his journey, and read as he ate. His seat was on the last slope of a grassy hill, where many huge stones rose out of the grass. A few yards beneath was a country road, and on the other side of the road a small stream, in which the brook that ran swiftly past, almost within reach of his hand, eagerly lost itself. On the further bank of the stream, perfuming the air, grew many bushes of meadow-sweet, or queen of the meadow, as it is called in Scotland, and beyond lay a lovely stretch of nearly level pasture. Farther eastward all was a plain, full of farms. Behind him rose the hill, shutting out his past. Before him lay the plain, open to his eyes and feet, God had walled up his past and was disclosing his future. When he had eaten his dinner, its dryness forgotten in the condiment his book supplied, he rose, and taking his cap from his head, filled it from the stream and drank heartily. 
then emptied it, shook the last drops from it, and put it again upon his head. "'Ho, ho, young man!' cried a voice. Donal looked, and saw a man in the garb of a clergyman regarding him from the road, and wiping his face with his sleeve. "'You should mind,' he continued, "'how you scatter your favours.' "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Donal, taking off his cap again. "'I had not a notion there was living creature near me.' "'It's a fine day,' said the minister. "'It is that, sir,' answered Donal. "'Which way are you going?' asked the minister, adding, as if in apology for his seeming curiosity, "'You're a scholar, I see,' with a glance towards the book he had left open on his stone. "'Na so muckle as I would fain be, sir,' answered Donal, then called to mind a resolve he had made to speak English for the future. "'A modest youth, I see,' returned the clergyman, but Donal hardly liked the tone in which he said it. "'That depends on what you mean by a scholar,' he said. "'Oh,' answered the minister, not thinking much about his reply, but in a bantering humour willing to draw the lad out. "'The learned man modestly calls himself a scholar.' "'Then there was no modesty in saying I was not so much of a scholar as I should like to be. Every scholar would say the same.' "'A very good answer,' said the clergyman patronizingly. "'You'll be a learned man some day.' And he smiled as he said it. "'When would you call a man learned?' asked Donal. "'That is hard to determine, seeing those that claim to be contradict each other so. What good, then, can there be in wanting to be learned? You get the mental discipline of study.' "'It seems to me,' said Donal, "'a pity to get a body's discipline on what may be worthless. It's just as good discipline to my teeth to dine on bread and cheese as it would be to exercise them on sheep's grass.' "'I've got hold of a humorist,' said the clergyman to himself." Donal picked up his wallet and his book and came down to the road. Then first the clergyman saw that he was barefooted. In his childhood he had himself often gone without shoes and stockings, yet the youth's lack of them prejudiced him against him. "'It must be the fellow's own fault,' he said to himself. "'He shan't catch me with his chaff.' Donal would rather have forded the river and gone to inquire his way at the nearest farmhouse, but he thought it polite to walk a little way with the clergyman. "'How far are you going?' asked the minister at length. "'As far as I can,' replied Donal. "'Where do you mean to pass the night? "'In some barn, perhaps, or on some hillside. "'I am sorry to hear you can do no better.' "'You don't think, sir, what a decent bed costs. "'And a barn is generally, a hillside always clean. "'In fact, the hillside's the best. "'Many's the time I have slept on one. "'It's a strange notion some people have "'that it's more respectable to sleep under man's roof than God's. "'To have no settled abode.' said the clergyman, and paused. "'Like Abraham?' suggested Donal with a smile. "'An abiding city seems hardly necessary to pilgrims and strangers. "'I fell asleep once on the top of Glashgar. "'When I woke, the sun was looking over the edge of the horizon. "'I rose and gazed about me as if I were but that moment created. "'If God had called me, I should hardly have been astonished.' "'Or frightened?' asked the minister. "'No, sir. Why should a man fear the presence of his saviour? "'You said God.' "'answered the minister. "'God is my saviour. "'Into his presence it is my desire to come. "'Under shelter of the atonement,' supplemented the minister. "'Gin ye mean by that, sir,' cried Donal, forgetting his English, "'anything to come atween my God and me, "'I'll had none of it. "'I'll had nothing hide me frae him who made me. "'I wouldna hide a thought frae him. "'The word it is, the mare need he see it.' "'What book is that you are reading?' asked the minister sharply. "'It's not your Bible, I'll be bound.' "'You never got such notions from it.' "'He was angry with the presumptuous youth, "'and no wonder, "'for the gospel the minister preached "'was a gospel but to the slavish and unfilial. "'It's Shelley,' answered Donal, recovering himself. "'The minister had never read a word of Shelley, "'but had a very decided opinion of him. "'He gave a loud, rude whistle. "'So, that's where you go for your theology. "'I was puzzled to understand you, but now all is plain. "'Young man, you are on the brink of perdition.' "'That book will poison your very vitals.' "'Indeed, sir, it will never go deep enough for that. "'But it came near touching them as I sat eating my bread and cheese. "'He's an infidel,' said the minister fiercely. "'A kind of one,' returned Donal, "'but not of the worst sort. "'It's the people who call themselves believers "'that drive the like of poor Shelley to the mouth of the pit. "'He hated the truth,' said the minister. "'He was always seeking after it,' said Donal, "'though to be sure he didn't get to the end of the search.' "'Just listen to this, sir, and say whether it be very far from Christian.' Donal opened his little volume and sought his passage. 
the minister, but for curiosity and the dread of seeming absurd, would have stopped his ears and refused to listen. He was a man of not merely dry or stale, but of deadly doctrines. He would have a man love Christ for protecting him from God, not for leading him to God, in whom alone is bliss, out of whom all is darkness and misery. He had not a glimmer of the truth that eternal life is to know God. He imagined justice and love dwelling in eternal opposition, in the bosom of eternal unity. He knew next to nothing about God, and misrepresented him hideously. If God were such as he showed him, it would be the worst possible misfortune to have been created. Donal had found the passage. It was in the Mask of Anarchy. He read the following stanzas. Let a vast assembly be, and with great solemnity, declare with measured words that ye are as God has made ye free. Be your strong and simple words, keen to wound as sharpened swords, and wide as targes let them be, with their shade to cover ye. And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there, slash and stab and maim and hew, what they like, that let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes, and little fear and less surprise, look upon them as they slay, till their rage has died away. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. Ending, the reader turned to the listener. But the listener had understood little of the meaning, and less of the spirit. He hated opposition to the powers on the part of any below himself, yet scorned the idea of submitting to persecution. "'What think you of that, sir?' asked Donal. "'Sheer nonsense,' answered the minister. "'Where would Scotland be now but for resistance?' "'There's more than one way of resisting, though,' returned Donal. "'Enduring evil was the Lord's way. "'I don't know about Scotland, but I fancy there would be more Christians, "'and of a better stamp in the world, "'if that had been the mode of resistance always adopted "'by those that called themselves such. "'Anyhow, it was his way. "'Shelley's, you mean?' "'I don't mean Shelley's, I mean Christ's. "'In spirit, Shelley was far nearer the truth "'than those who made him despise the very name of Christianity "'without knowing what it really was. "'But God will give every man fair play.' "'Young man!' said the minister, with an assumption of great solemnity and no less authority. I am bound to warn you that you are in a state of rebellion against God, and he will not be mocked. Good morning. Donal sat down on the roadside. He would let the minister have a good start of him. Took again his shabby little volume, held more talk with the book-embodied spirit of Shelley, and saw more and more clearly how he was misled in his every notion of Christianity and how different those who gave him his notions must have been from the evangelists and apostles. He saw in the poet a boyish nature striving after liberty, with scarce a notion of what liberty really was. He knew nothing of the law of liberty, oneness with the will of our existence, which would have us free with its own freedom. When the clergyman was long out of sight, he rose and went on, and soon came to a bridge by which he crossed the river. Then on he went, through the cultivated plain, his spirits never flagging. He was a pilgrim on his way to his divine fate. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Donald Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 3 The Moor The night began to descend, and he to be weary, and look about him for a place of repose. But there was a long twilight before him, and it was warm. For some time the road had been ascending, and by and by he found himself on a bare moor, among heather not yet in bloom, and a forest of bracken. Here was a great, beautiful chamber for him, and what better bed than God's heather? What better canopy than God's high, star-studded night, with its airy curtains of dusky darkness? Was it not in this very chamber that Jacob had his vision of the mighty stair leading up to the gate of heaven? Was it not under such a roof Jesus spent his last nights on the earth? For comfort and protection he sought no human shelter, but went out into his father's house, out under his father's heaven. The small and narrow were not to him the safe, but the wide and open. Thick walls cover men from the enemies they fear. The Lord sought space. 
There the angels come and go more freely than where roofs gather distrust. If ever we hear a far-off rumor of angel visit, is it not from some solitary plain with lonely children? Donal walked along the high tableland till he was weary, and rest looked blissful. Then he turned aside from the rough track into the heather and bracken. When he came to a little dry hollow, with a yet thicker growth of heather, its tops almost close as those of his bed at his father's cottage, he sought no further. Taking his knife, he cut a quantity of heather and ferns, and heaped it on the top of the thickest bush. Then, creeping in between the cut and the growing, he cleared the former from his face that he might see the worlds over him, and putting his knapsack under his head, fell fast asleep. When he woke, not even the shadow of a dream lingered to let him know what he had been dreaming. He woke with such a clear mind, such an immediate uplifting of the soul, that it seemed to him no less than to Jacob that he must have slept at the foot of the heavenly stair. The wind came round him like the stuff of thought unshaped, and every breath he drew seemed like God breathing afresh into his nostrils the breath of life. Who knows what the thing we call air is? We know about it, but it we do not know. The sun shone as if smiling at the self-importance of the sulky darkness he had driven away, and the world seemed content with a heavenly content. So fresh was Donal's sense that he felt as if his sleep within and the wind without had been washing him all the night. So peaceful, so blissful was his heart that it longed to share its bliss. But there was no one within sight, and he set out again on his journey. He had not gone far when he came to a dip in the moorland. A round hollow with a cottage of turf in the middle of it, from whose chimney came a little smoke. There, too, the day was begun. He was glad he had not seen it before, for then he might have missed the repose of the open night. At the door stood a little girl in a blue frock. She saw him and ran in. He went down and drew near to the door. It stood wide open, and he could not help seeing in. A man sat at the table in the middle of the floor, his forehead on his hand. Donald did not see his face. He seemed waiting, like his father, for the book, while his mother got it from the top of the wall. He stepped over the threshold, and in the simplicity of his heart, said, "'Ye'll be going to have worship.' "'Na, nah, na,' nah, returned the man, raising his head, and taking a brief, hard stare at his visitor. "'We dinna set up for praying folk in his house. We lay that to them it kens what they had to be thankful for.' "'I made a mistake,' said Donal. "'I thought you might have been going to say good morning to your maker, and would I like it to join with ye, for I ken not what I had not to be thankful for. Good day to ye.' "'Ye can bide and take your porridge, can ye like?' "'Oh, na, nah, I thank ye. "'Ye might think I came for the porridge, and not for the prayers. "'I like as ill to be counted a hypocrite as gin I were one.' "'Ye can bide a hair worship with us, gin ye take the book yoursel. "'I canna lead where is none to follow. "'Na, nah, I'll do better on the moor, my lone. "'But the good wife was a religious woman after her fashion. "'Who can be after anyone else's? "'She came with a Bible in her hand and silently laid it on the table.' Donal had never yet prayed aloud, except in a murmur by himself on the hill, but thus invited could not refuse. He read a psalm of trouble, breaking into hope at the close, then spoke as follows. "'Friends, I'm but young, as ye see, and never afore dared open my mouth in such fashion. But it comes to me to speak, and wi' your leave speak I will. I canna help thinkin' the good men's in some trouble, suck like maybe as King David when he made the psalm I had been readin' in your hearin'. Ye observed how it began like a stormy morning, but ye heard how it changed or all was done. The sun comes out bonny in the end, and ye hear the birds beginning to sing, telling nature to give o'er her greeting. And what brings a good man to his senses, do ye think? What but just the thought o' him it made him, him it cares about him, him it mung come to ill himself afore he let anything he made come to ill. Sir, let's gang down upon our knees, and commit the keeping of our souls to him as till a faithful creator who winna miss his part between him and his. They went down on their knees, and Donal said, O Lord, our own Father and Saviour, the day ye has sent us has arrived bonny and grand, and we bless ye for sending it. But, eh, our Father, we need mere the light that shines in the darker place. We need the dawn of a spiritual day inside us, or the bonny day outside when I gang for muckle. Lord, our might, Speak a word of peaceful recall to any dog o' thine it may be worrying at the heart o' any sheep o' thine that's run away. But dinna call him back so as to leave the poor sheep behind him. 
Best back dog and lamb together, O Lord. Hold us all for ill, and guide us all to good, and our morning prayers o'er. Amen. They rose from their knees, and sat silent for a moment. Then the good wife put the pot on the fire with the water for the porridge. But Donal rose and walked out of the cottage, half wondering at himself that he had dared as he had, yet feeling he had done but the most natural thing in the world. "'Who a body's the wind through the day wantin' the lord of the day and the hour and the minute is he aunt me?' he said to himself, and hastened away. Ere noon, the blue line of the far ocean rose on the horizon. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Donald Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Four The Town. Donald was queer, some of my readers will think, and I admit it. For the man who regards the affairs of life from any other point than his own greedy self must be queer indeed in the eyes of all who are slaves to their imagined necessities and undisputed desires. It was evening when he drew nigh the place whither he had directed his steps, a little country town not far from a famous seat of learning. There he would make inquiry before going further. The minister of his parish knew the minister of Auker's and had given him a letter of introduction. The country around had not a few dwellings of distinction, and at one or another of these might be children in want of a tutor. The sun was setting over the hills behind him as he entered the little town. At first it looked but a village, for on the outskirts, through which the king's highway led, were chiefly thatched cottages, with here and there a slated house of one story and an attic. But presently began to appear houses of larger size, few of them, however, of more than two stories. Most of them looked as if they had a long and not very happy history. All at once he found himself in a street, partly of quaint gables with corbel steps. They called them here Corby Steps, in allusion perhaps to the raven sent out by Noah, for which lazy bird the children regarded these as places to rest. There were two or three curious gateways in it with some attempt at decoration, and one house with the pepper-pot turrets which Scottish architecture has borrowed from the French chateau. The heart of the town was a yet narrower close-built street, with several short closes and winds opening out of it, all of which had ancient-looking houses. There were shops, not a few, but their windows were those of dwellings, as the upper parts of their buildings mostly were. In those shops was as good a supply of the necessities of life as in a great town, and cheaper. You could not get a coat so well cut, nor a pair of shoes to fit you so tight without hurting, but you could get first-rate work. The streets were unevenly paved with round, water-worn stones. Donal was not sorry that he had not to walk far upon them. The setting sun sent his shadow before him as he entered the place. He kept the middle of the street, looking on this side and that for the hostelry whither he had dispatched his chest before leaving home. A gloomy building, apparently uninhabited, drew his attention, and sent a strange thrill through him as his eyes fell upon it. It was of three low stories— the windows defended by iron stanchions, the door studded with great knobs of iron. A little way beyond, he caught sight of the sign he was in search of. It swung in front of an old-fashioned, dingy building, with much of the old-world look that pervaded the town. The last red rays of the sun were upon it, lighting up a sorely faded coat of arms. The supporters, two red horses on their hind legs, were all of it he could make out. The crest above suggested a skate, but could hardly have been intended for one. A greedy-eyed man stood in the doorway, his hands in his trouser pockets. He looked with contemptuous scrutiny at the barefooted lad approaching him. He had black hair and black eyes. His nose looked as if a heavy finger had settled upon its point and pressed it downwards. Its nostrils swelled wide beyond their base. Underneath was a big mouth with a good set of teeth and a strong upturning chin an ambitious and greedy face. But ambition is a form of greed. "'A fine day, landlord,' said Donal. "'Aye,' answered the man, without changing the posture of one taking his ease against his own doorpost, or removing his hands from his pockets, but looking Donal up and down with conscious superiority, then resting his eyes on the bare feet and upturned trousers. 
"'This'll be the Morven Arms, I'm thinking,' said Donal. "'It takes no muckle thought to think that,' returned the innkeeper. "'When there they hang.' "'Aye,' rejoined Donal, glancing up. "'There is something there, and it's arms, I doubt not. "'But it's no obbody has the privilege of a knowledge of heraldry like yourself, landlord. "'I'm born to confess, for what I ken, they might be the arms of any one of ten score Scots families.' There was one weapon with which John Glum was assailable, and that was ridicule. With all his self-sufficiency he stood in terror of it, and the more covert the ridicule, so long as he suspected it, the more he resented as well as dreaded it. He stepped into the street, and taking a hand from a pocket, pointed up to the sign. "'See till it,' he said. "'Dinna ye see the two red horse?' "'Aye,' answered Donal. "'I see them well enough. But I'm none the wiser nor gin they were two red whales.' "'Man,' he went on, turning sharp round upon the fellow, "'you're not capable of conceiving the extent of my ignorance. "'It's as rampant as the red horse upon your sign. "'I'll yield to nobody in the amount of things I dinna ken.' "'The man stared at him for a moment. "'I shall warrant,' he said, "'you ken mare nor you care to let on. "'And what may that be o'er the head of him? "'A crest, call ye it?' said Donal. "'It's a base pearl beset, answered the landlord. He had not a notion of what a base meant, or pearl beset, yet prided himself on his knowledge of the words. Eh, returned Donal, I took it for a skate. A skate, repeated the landlord with offended sneer, and turned towards the house. I was thinking to put up wi' ye the night, gin ye could accommodate me at a reasonable rate, said Donal. I do not ken, replied Glum, hesitating with his back to him, between unwillingness to lose a penny and resentment at the supposed badinage which was indeed nothing but humour. What would you call reasonable? "'I wouldna grudge a sixpence for my bed. A shillin' I would,' answered Donal. "'Well, ninepence, then, for ye seem not o'er come with siller.' "'Nah,' answered Donal, "'I'm no that. Whatever my burden yon's no hit, the loss o' what I have would hardly make me lighter for my race.' "'You're a queer customer,' said the man. "'I'm not so queer, but I have a kist coming by the carrier,' rejoined Donal. "'Direct it to the more than arms.' "'It'll be here in time, doubtless.' "'We'll see when it comes,' remarked the landlord, implying the chest was easier invented than believed in. "'The worst o' it is,' continued Donal, "'I cannot weel show myself wantin' shoon. "'I have a pair in my kist, and another upon my back, "'but none for my feet.' "'There's suitors enough,' said the innkeeper. "'Well, we'll see as we gang. "'I want a word with the minister. "'What do you direct me to the manse?' "'He's for home.' "'But it's a small consequence. "'He does not care about tramps, honest man. "'He win a war muckle upon the likes of you.' "'The landlord was recovering himself, "'therefore his insolence. "'Donal gave a laugh. "'Those who are content with what they are "'have the less concern about what they seem. "'The ambitious like to be taken for more than they are, "'and may well be annoyed when they are taken for less. "'I'm thinking ye wouldn't a war muckle on a tramp either,' he said. "'I would not,' answered Glum. "'It's the part of the honest to discountenance lawlessness.' "'You wouldn't a hang the poor creatures, would you?' asked Donal. "'I would hang a wee and mare of them. "'For not having a house over their heads. That's some hard. "'What gain you as one day to be in want of one yourself?' "'We'll bide till the day comes. "'But what are you standing there for? "'Are you coming in, or are you no?' "'It's a some cold welcome,' said Donal. "'I shall just take a look about afore I make up my mind. "'A tramp, you ken, needs na stand upon ceremony.' He turned away and walked further along the street. End of chapter 4《Chapter V The Cobbler》At the end of the street he came to a low-arched gateway in the middle of a poor-looking house. Within it sat a little bowed man, cobbling diligently at a boot. The sun had left behind him in the west a heap of golden refuse and cuttings of rose and purple which shone right in at the archway and let him see to work. Here was the very man for Donal. A respectable shoemaker would have disdained to patch up the shoes he carried, especially as the owner was in so much need of them. "'It's a bonny night,' he said. "'Ye may weel make the remark, sir. 
replied the cobbler without looking up, for a critical stitch occupied him. "'It's a balmy night.' "'That's rather a bonny word to put till it,' returned Donal. "'There's a kind of an air about the place I would hardly have thought balmy. "'But truth is not the fault of the night.' "'You're right there also,' returned the cobbler, his use of the conjunction impressing Donal. "'Still the weather has to do with the smell, with the mare or less of it, that is. "'It comes frae a tannery nearby. "'It's not an ill smell to them as used to it, "'and ye would hardly believe me, sir, but I smell the clover through it. "'Maybe I'm prejudiced, seeing but for the tan pits I couldn't a whale drive my trade, "'but sitting here from morning to night I get a kind o' a habit o' looking out for my blessings. "'To recognize an old blessings most better nor to get a new one. "'A pair of shoon whale cobbles whiles full better nor a new pair.' "'They are that,' said Donal. "'But I dinna just see how your simile applies. "'Isn't it getting on a pair of old will kent and will mend at shoon "'at winna nip your feet nor yet shuckle, "'like waking up till a blessing ye been having for years, "'only ye dinna ken it for one?' "'As he spoke, the cobbler lifted a little wizened face "'and a pair of twinkling eyes to those of the student, "'revealing a soul as original as his own. "'He was one of the inwardly inseparable, outwardly far divided company of christian philosophers among whom individuality as well as patience is free to work its perfect work in that glance donal saw a ripe soul looking out of its tent door ready to rush into the sunshine of the new life he stood for a moment lost in eternal regard of the man he seemed to have known him for ages the cobbler looked up again you'll be wanting a hand frae me my ain line i'm thinking he said, with a kindly nod towards Donal's shoeless feet. "'Small doubt,' returned Donal. "'I had scarce started, but was o'er far to gain back, when the sole of one shoe came off, and I had to tramp it with both my ain.' "'And ye think at the Lord for the old blessing of being born and brought up with souls of your ain?' "'To tell the truth,' answered Donal, "'I has so many things to be thankful for. It's but small wonder I forget many one of them. But no, and I thank ye for the exhortation.' The Lord's name be praised, he gave me feet fit for ganging upon. He took his shoes from his back, and untying the string that bound them, presented the ailing one to the cobbler. "'That's what we may call death,' remarked the cobbler, slowly turning the invalided shoe. "'Aye, death it is,' answered Donal. "'It's a sair divorce of soul and body.' "'It's a some old foreign joke,' said the cobbler. "'But the fun until a thing doesn't a wear out.' any mare of the poetry or the truth into it. "'Who will say there was no providence in the loss of my shoe sole?' remarked Donal to himself. "'Here I am with a friend already.' The cobbler was submitting the shoes, first the sickly one, now the sound one, to a thorough scrutiny. "'You dinna think them worth mending, I don't,' said Donal, with a touch of anxiety in his tone. "'I never thought that, where the leather would hold the stick,' replied the cobbler. "'But whiles, I confess, I'm just a wean tribble to ken how to charge for my work. It's no barely to consider the time it'll take me to cloot a pair, but what the wearer's like to get out of them. I cannot take mere nor the job'll be worth to the wearer, and yet the war the shoon, and the less to be made of them, the more time they take to make them worth anything of all. Surely you ought to be paid in proportion to your labour. In that case I would whiles have to say to the poor body it hadna another pair in the world, at her one pair of shoon wasna worth minning. "'and that would be a heartbreak and sair feet for by, "'to sick as couldn't like yourself, sir, "'gang upon the Lord's end shoon.' "'But who make ye live in that way?' suggested Donal. "'Who's oh, the maister of the trade sees to my wages?' "'And who may he be?' asked Donal, "'well foreseeing the answer. "'He was never cobbler himself, "'but he was once carpenter, "'and know he's lifted up to be head of all the trades. "'And there's one thing he can abide, "'and that's close pairing. "'He stopped.' But Donal held his peace, waiting, and he went on. To them it makes little for reasons good by their neighbour. He gives the better wages when they gang home. To them it makes all that they can, he says. Ye help it yourself. Help away. Ye had your reward. Only come na near me, for I canna bide ye. But about the shoon o' yours, I dinna well ken. They're well enough worth doing the best I can for them. But the morn's Sunday, and what hae ye to put on? Nothing, till my kiss comes. "'And that, I doubt, winna be afore Monday, or maybe the day after. "'And ye winna be able to gang to the kirk. "'I'm not particular about going to the kirk, "'but gin I wanted to gang, or gin I thought I was born to gang, "'think ye I would bide at home, cause I had no shoon to gang in. "'Would I fancy the Lord affront it with the bare feet he made himself?' 
the cobbler caught up the worst shoe and began upon it at once. "'You sit out, sir,' he said. "'Can I sit all night at it? "'The one'll do till Monday. "'You sit out afore kirk time, "'but you maun come into the house to get it, "'for the folk would be scunnered to see me working upon the Sabbath day. "'They dinna understand that the master works Sunday and Saturday, "'and his father is well. "'You dinna think, then, there's anything wrong "'in men in a pair of shoon on the Sabbath day? "'Wrong, in obeying my master, "'whose is the day as well as all the days. "'They would fain take it for the son of man, "'who is the lord of it, but they canna. He looked up over the old shoe with eyes that flashed. "'But then, excuse me,' said Donal, "'why shouldna ye hold your face till it, and work openly in the name of God?' "'We're tilt neither to do our good works afore men to be seen of them, nor yet to cast our pearls afore swine. I count cobbling your shoes, sir, a far better work nor going to the kirk, and I would not have it seen a men. Gin I were working for poverty, it would be another thing.' This last Donal did not understand, but learned afterwards what the cobbler meant. The day being for rest, the next duty to helping another was to rest himself. To work for fear of starving would be to distrust the father, and act as if man lived by bread alone. "'When I think of it,' he resumed after a pause, "'be in Sunday. I'll take them home to you. Where will you be?' "'That's what I would fain how you tell me,' answered Donal. "'I had thought to put up at the Morven Arms, but there's something I didn't like about the landlord. Can you any decent, clean place where they would give me a room to myself, and no seek more nor I could pay them? We have a bit roomy ourselves, said the cobbler, at the service of any decent wayfaring man that can stand the smell, and put up with our ways. For payment, you can pay what you think it's worth. We're never very particular. I take your offer with thankfulness, answered Donal. Well, gang ye in at that door just afore ye, and you'll see the good wife. There's none either to see. I would gang with ye myself, but I canna with this shoe of yours to turn into a Sunday one. Donal went to the door indicated. It stood wide open, for while the cobbler sat outside at his work, his wife would never shut the door. He knocked, but there came no answer. She's some dull hearing, said the cobbler, and called her by his own name for her. Dory, Dory, he said. She canna be that diff, gin she hears ye, said Donal, for he spoke hardly louder than usual. "'When God gives you a wife, may she be one to hear your lightest word,' answered the cobbler. Sure enough, he had scarcely finished the sentence when Dory appeared at the door. "'Did you cry, Goodman?' she said. "'Na, nah, Dory, I canna say I cried, but I speck, and ye, as is your custom, hearken till my word. Here's a believing lad. I'm thinking he maun be a gentleman, but I'm not sure. It's hard for a cobbler to ken a gentleman it comes till him wantin' shoon. But he may be a gentleman for all that.' "'and there's no hurry to ken. "'He's welcome to me, gin he be welcome to you. "'Can ye gie him a night's lodging?' "'Weel that, and wi' all my heart, said Dory. "'He's welcome to what we have. "'Turning, she led the way into the house. "'End of chapter 5「'Chapter 6 of Donal Grant "'This is a LibriVox recording.' All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 6. Dory. She was a very small, spare woman, in a blue print with little white spots. Straight, not bowed like her husband. Otherwise, she seemed at first exactly like him. But ere the evening was over, Donal saw there was no feature or resemblance between the two faces, and was puzzled to understand how the two expressions came to be so like. As they sat, it seemed in the silence as if they were the same person, thinking in two shapes and two places. Following the old woman, Donal ascended a steep and narrow stair, which soon brought him to a landing where was light, coming mainly through green leaves, for the window in the little passage was filled with plants. His guide led him into what seemed to him an enchanting room. Homely enough it was, but luxurious compared to what he had been accustomed to. He saw white walls and a brown-hued but clean-swept wooden floor, on which shone a keen-eyed little fire from a low grate. Two easy chairs, covered with some party-colored striped stuff, stood one on each side of the fire. A kettle was singing on the hob. The white deal table was set for tea with a fat brown teapot and cups of a gorgeous pattern in bronze that shone in the firelight like red gold. 
In one of the walls was a box bed. "'I'll let you see what accommodation we have at your service, sir,' said Dory. "'And gin that'll suit you, you to be welcome.' So saying, she opened what looked like the door of a cupboard at the side of the fireplace. It disclosed a neat little parlour with a sweet air in it. The floor was sanded, and so much the cleaner than if it had been carpeted. A small mahogany table, black with age, stood in the middle. On a side table, covered with a cloth of faded green, lay a large family Bible. Behind it were a few books and a tea caddy. In the side of the wall opposite the window was again a box bed. To the eyes of the shepherd-born lad, it looked the most desirable shelter he had ever seen. He turned to his hostess and said, "'I'm feared it's o'er good for me. What could you let me have it for by the week? I would fain bide with ye, but whar and when I may get work I cannot tell, so I mawna take it any gate for mere nor a week.' "'Make yourself at ease till the morn be by,' said the old woman. "'You cannot do nothing till that be o'er. Upon the Monday morning we shall hold a council together, you and me and my man.' I can do nothing wantin' my man. We aye pull together, or not at all. Well content, and with hearty thanks, Donal committed his present fate into the hands of the humble pair, his heaven-sent helpers. And after much washing and brushing, all that was possible to him in the way of dressing, reappeared in the kitchen. Their tea was ready, and the cobbler seated in the window with a book in his hand, leaving for Donal his easy chair. "'I cannot take your own chair, frae ye,' said Donal. "'Hoots!' returned the cobbler. What's anything ours for but to give the neighbour it stands in need of it? But ye had a sore day's work, and you a sair day's travel. But I'm young, and I'm old and my labour the nearer o'er. But I'm strong. There's none the less need ye shall be holding so. Sit ye down and waste not your backbone. My business is to look to the bodies o' men, and specially to their poor feet it has to bide the weight, and get sair pressed therein. Life's as hard upon the feet of a man as upon any part of him. When they gang wrong, there is no muckle to be done till they be set right again. I'm sair honoured, I say to myself, whiles, to be set o'er the feet o' men. It's a fine ministration, full better than being a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, for the feet it gang out and in at it is mair nor the door. The Lord be praised, said Donal to himself. There's mair in the world like my father and mither. He took the seat appointed him. Come to the table, Andrew, said the old woman. Gin so be you can part with that book o' yours, and let your soul give place to your body's rights. I doubt, sir, gin he would ate or drink, gin I wasna at his elbow. Dory, returned her husband, you canna deny I gie you a bit now and then, especially when I come upon anything by ordinary tasty. That you do, Anru, or I dinna ken what would come o' my soul any murner o' your body. So you see, sir, we're like John Spratt and his wife. You'll ken the bairn say about them. Aye, fine that, replied Donal. You couldn't well be better fitted. God grant it, she said. But we would fit better yet, gin I had but ween mare brains. The Lord kenned what brains you had when he brought you together, said Donal. You never uttered a truer word, replied the cobbler. Gin the Lord be content with the brains he's gin ye, and I be content with the brains ye give me, what right ha ye to be discontented with the brains ye had, Dory? Answer me that. But I should come to the table. Would ye allow me to speer after your name, sir? "'My name's Donal Grant,' replied Donal. "'I thank you, sir, and I'll hold it in respect,' returned the cobbler. "'Mr. Grant, will you ask a blessing?' "'I would rather join in your asking,' replied Donal. The cobbler said a little prayer, and then they began to eat. First of oat cakes, baked by the old woman, then of loaf bread, as they called it. "'I'm sorry I had no jelly or jam to set afore you, sir,' said Dory. "'We are but simple folk, you see.' "'content to hold our earthly tabernacles in a habitable condition "'till we had notice to quit.' "'It's a fine thing to ken,' said the cobbler, with a queer look. "'At when you leave it, your house falls down, "'and you had not to think of any damages to pay. "'For by it, gin it last at any time after you was out of it, "'there might be a wheen devils taken up their abode into it.' "'Hoot, Andrew,' interposed his wife. "'There's nothing like that in Scripture.' "'Hoot, Dory,' returned Andrew. "'What ken you about what's not in Scripture?' You can a heap I allow about what's in Scripture, but you can little about what's not into it. Well, isn't it best to ken what's into it? I yon't a doubt. Well, she returned in playful triumph. Donal saw that he had got hold of a pair of originals. It was a joy to his heart. He was himself an original, one namely that lived close to the simplicities of existence. 
Andrew Comyn, before offering him house room, would never have asked anyone what he was, but he would have thought it was an equal lapse in breeding not to show interest in the history as well as the person of a guest. After a little more talk, so far from commonplace that the common would have found it mirth-provoking, the cobbler said, "'And what office may you hold yourself, sir, in the ministry of the temple?' "'I think I understand you,' replied Donal. "'My mother says curious things like you.' "'Curious things as well as no that curious,' remarked Andrew. A pause following, he resumed. "'Can anything give you reason to prefer waiting till you can do you and me a bit better, sir?' he said. "'Count my ill-mannered question no spirit.' "'There's nothing,' answered Donal. "'I'll tell you anything or all thing about myself.' "'Till what you will, sir, and keep what you will,' said the cobbler. "'I was brought up a herd, laddie,' proceeded Donal, "'and whiles a shepherd one. "'For many a year I can't mare about the hillside nor the inglenook, "'but it's the same God and Father upon the hillside and in the king's palace. "'And ye'll ken all about the wind and the clothes "'and the ways of God outside the house. "'I ken something how he holds things gone inside the house, in a body's heart, I mean, in mine and Doody's there, but I ken little about the way he gars things work it he's not so far been in. You dinna surely think God fills not all thing? exclaimed Donal. Na, nah, na, nah, I ken better nor that, answered the cobbler. But you mun allow a tod's holes not so deep as the throat of a burning mountain. God himself canna win so far been in a shallow place as in a deep place. He canna be so far been in the winds, though he gars them do as he likes, as he is or should be, in your heart and mine, sir. "'I see,' responded Donal. "'Could that have been how the Lord had to rebuke the wind and the waves, "'as gin they had been gone at their own free will, "'instead of the will at him that made them and set them gone?' "'Maybe, but I would have to think about it before I answered,' replied the cobbler. "'A silence intervened. "'Then said Andrew thoughtfully, "'I thought when I saw you first you was maybe a lad for a shop in the muckle tone, "'or a clerk, as they call him, it sits making up accounts.' "'No, nah, I'm not that, I thank God,' said Donal. "'What for thank ye God for that?' asked Andrew. "'Our place is his. I wouldna how you thank God you're not a cobbler like me. "'You might, though, for it's little you can ken of the good of the calling.' "'I'll tell you what for,' answered Donal. "'I ken weel, town folk think it a heap better to have to do with figures nor with sheep. "'But I'm not o' their mind. And for one thing, the sheep's alive. "'I could weel fancy an angel a shepherd, and he would count my father good company. "'Truth, he would want wings and arms and feet and all to look after the lamb's wiles.' "'But gin sicker one was a clerk in a cotton house "'he would have to stow away the wings. "'I cannot see what use he would have for them there. "'He might be an angel all the time, "'and that not a fallen one. "'But he bud to lay aside something to fit the place.' "'But you're not a shepherd the no,' said the cobbler. "'Nah,' replied Donal. "'Sep it be I'm set to look after another grade o' lamb. "'A friend, ye may a heard his name, "'Sir Gilbert Galbraith, "'made the beginning of a scholar of me, "'and know I have my degree for the old University of Inverdour. "'Dinna I think is muckle?' cried Mistress Comyn triumphant. "'I had not time to say it to ye, Andrew, but I was sure he was for the college, "'and that was how his feet were so muckle worse furnished nor his head.' "'I have a pair of shoon in my kiss, though, when that comes,' said Donal, laughing. "'I only hope it winna be o'er muckle to win up our stair.' "'I dinna think it, but we'll leave it in the street before it should come atween us,' said Donal. "'Gin ye'll have me, so long as I'm in the town I sa gang na other gate.' "'And you'll doubtless read the Greek like your mither tongue,' said the cobbler, with a longing admiration in his tone. "'Na, nah, not like that, but weel enough to get good of it.' "'Weel, that's just the one thing I grudge you. "'Na, nah, no grudge. I'm glad you have it. "'But the one thing I would fain be a scholar for myself, "'to think I cannot achieve of the word spoken by the word himself. "'But the letter of the word he made little of compare it with the spirit,' said Donal. "'Aye, that's true.' "'And yet it's what a man may well be greedy and want to have all thing. "'Who has the spirit would fain have the letter too. "'But it is no matter. "'I shall set to learning it the first thing when I gang up the stair. "'That is, gin it be the Lord's will.' "'Hoots,' said his wife. "'What would you do with Greek up there? "'I so warrant the folk there, "'I and the maester himself, speaks plain Scotch. "'What for no? "'What would they do there with Greek, "'at a body would have to warstle with from morning to night, "'and not make out the third part of it?' Her husband laughed merrily, but Donal said, "'Deed, maybe you're not so far wrong, good wife. "'I'm thinking there mun be a grand mither tongue there. "'It'll soup up all the lave, and be better to understand nor a body's on, "'for it'll be yet more his on.' "'Here till him,' cried the cobbler, with hearty approbation. "'You can,' Donal went on. "'All the languages of the earth came, or look as gin they had come, for a one, "'though we're not just dog sure of that. 
There's my mother's ain Gaelic, for instance. It's as old, maybe older nor the Greek. Anige, it has mere Greek nor Latin words into it, and ye ken the Greek's an older tongue nor the Latin. Well, gin we could work our way back to the oldest great grandmother tongue o' all, I'm thinking it would come a kind o' so easy to us, that with the improved faculties of our heavenly condition, we might be able in a few days to hold communication with one another in that same, on stammer or hummed and hawed. But there's been such a heap o' things found out since then, in the mind o' man as well as in the world outside, said Andrew, that such a language would be mere like a baron's tongue nor a mither's, I'm thinking, when set against all it would be to speak about. You're very right there, I dinna doubt. But how easy would it be for ilk one to bring in the new word he wanted, having enough common afore to explain it with? Afore long the language would have into it ilk a word it was worth having in any language it ever was spoken since the Torah Babel. Eh, sirs, but it's dreadful to think o' having to learn so muckle, said the old woman. I'm o'er old and dull Her husband laughed again. I did not see what you had to laugh at, she said, laughing too. You'll be dull yourself gin ye live long enough. I'm thinking, said Andrew, but I dinna ken, and it maun be a man's own weight gin age makes him dulled. Gin he's aye been holden by the truth, I dinna think he'll find the truth has no holden by him. But what I was laughing at was the thought of anybody being old up there. We'll all be young there, lass. It shall be as Lord wills, returned his wife. It shall. We want no more, and eh, we want no less, responded her husband. So the evening wore away. The talk was very to the mind of Donal who never loved wisdom so much as when she appeared in peasant garb. In that garb he had first known her, and in the form of his mother. "'I wonder,' said Dory at length, "'at young Eppie's no putting in her appearance. I was sure o' her the night. She hasna been near us all the week.' The cobbler turned to Donal to explain. He would not talk of things their guest did not understand. That would be like shutting him out after taking him in. "'Young Eppie's a grandchild, sir, the only one we have. She's a well-behaved lass,' though ta'en up with the things of this world, mare nor her granny and me could worse. She's in a place no far for here, not an easy one maybe to give satisfaction in, but she's doing no that ill. Hoot, Anru, she's doing just as well as any lassie o' her years could in justice be expected, interposed the grandmother. It's seldom the Lord it sets old head upon young shoulders. The words were hardly spoken when a light foot was heard coming up the stair. But here she comes to answer for herself, she added cheerily. The door of the room opened, and a good-looking girl of about eighteen came in. "'Weel, young Eppie, ho's all with ye?' said the old man. The grandmother's name was Elspeth. The granddaughters had therefore always the prefix. "'Prawly, thank you, grandfather,' she answered. "'How's all with yourself?' "'Oh, weel, cobalt, he replied. "'Sit ye down,' said the grandmother, "'by the spark of the fire. "'The night's some airy like.' "'Na, granny, I want na fire,' said the girl.' I had run all the road to get a glimp of you for the week was out. How's things going up at the castle? Oh, sick like as usual. Only the housekeeper's some doughy, and that puts more upon the life of us. When she's well, she's not one to spare herself, or other folk either. I wouldn't care, gin she would but lip into the body, concluded young Eppy, with a toss of her head. We mauna speak evil of dignities, young Eppy, said the cobbler with a twinkle in his eye. Call you Mistress Brooks a dignity, grandfather, said the girl with a laugh that was nowise rude. "'I do,' he answered. "'Isn't it she or ye? Had not ye to do as she tells ye? Atween her and you, that's enough. She's one of the dignities spoken of.' "'I want to dispute it. But, eh, it's queer work, yonder.' "'Take ye care, young Eppie. We mun hold our tongues about things committed till our trust. One paid to serve in a house mun not treat the affairs of that house as gin they were her ain.' "'It would be well gin abody about the house was as particular as ye would have me, grandfather.' "'Who's my lord, lass?' "'Ow, oh, muckle the same. "'I up the stair and down the stair the fore part of the night, "'and most invisible all day.' "'The girl cast a shy glance now and then at Donal, "'as if she claimed him on her side, "'though the older people must be humoured. "'Donal was not too simple to understand her. "'He gave her look no reception. "'Bethinking himself that they might have matters to talk about, "'he rose, and turning to his hostess, said, "'Will you leave, good wife? "'I would gang to my bed.' "'I had travelled a matter of thirty mile the day upon my bare feet.' "'Eh, sir,' she answered, "'I ought to have considered that. "'Come, young Eppie, we mun get the gentleman's bed made up for him.' "'With a toss of her pretty head, "'Eppie followed her grandmother to the next room, "'casting a glance behind her that seemed to ask "'what she meant by calling a lad without shoes or stockings a gentleman. "'Not the less readily or actively, however, "'did she assist her grandmother in preparing the tired wayfarer's couch.' 
In a few minutes they returned, and telling him the room was quite ready for him, Doherty added a hope that he would sleep as sound as if his own mother had made the bed. He heard them talking for a while after the door was closed, but the girl soon took her leave. He was just falling asleep in the luxury of conscious repose, when the sound of the cobbler's hammer for a moment roused him, and he knew the old man was again at work on his behalf. A moment more and he was too fast asleep for any Cyclops's hammer to wake him. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Donald Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donald Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 7 A Sunday Notwithstanding his weariness, Donald woke early, for he had slept thoroughly. He rose and dressed himself, drew aside the little curtain that shrouded the window, and looked out. It was a lovely morning. His prospect was the curious old main street of the town. The sun that had shone into it was now shining from the other side, but not a shadow of living creature fell upon the rough stones. Yes, there was a cat shooting across them like the culprit he probably was. If there was a garden to the house, he would go and read in the fresh morning air. He stole softly through the outer room and down the stair, found the back door and a water butt, then a garden consisting of two or three plots of flowers well cared for, and ended his discoveries with a seat surrounded and almost canopied with honeysuckle, where doubtless the cobbler sometimes smoked his pipe. Why does he not work here rather than in the archway, thought Donal. But dearly as he loved flowers and light and the free air of the garden, the old cobbler loved the faces of his kind better. His prayer for forty years had been to be made like his master. And if that prayer was not answered, how was it that every year he lived he found himself loving the faces of his fellows more and more? Ever as they passed, instead of interfering with his contemplations, they gave him more and more to think. Were these faces, he asked, the symbols of a celestial language in which God talked to him? Donal sat down and took his Greek testament from his pocket. But all at once, brilliant as was the sun, the light of his life went out, and the vision rose of the grey quarry and the girl turning from him in the wan moonlight. Then swift as thought followed the vision of the women weeping about the forsaken tomb, and with his risen lord he rose also, into a region far above the smoke and stir of this dim spot, a region where life is good even with its sorrow. The man who sees his disappointment beneath him is more blessed than he who rejoices in fruition. Then prayer awoke, and in the light of that morning of peace he drew nigh the living one, and knew him as the source of his being. Weary with blessedness, he leaned against the shadowing honeysuckle, gave a great sigh of content, smiled, wiped his eyes, and was ready for the day and what it should bring. But the bliss went not yet. He sat for a while in the joy of conscious loss in the higher life. With his meditations and feelings mingled now and then a few muffled blows of the cobbler's hammer. He was once more at work on his disabled shoe. Here is a true man, he thought, a godlike helper of his fellow. When the hammer ceased, the cobbler was stitching. When Donal ceased thinking, he went on feeling. Again and again came a little roll of the cobbler's drum, giving glory to God by doing his will. The sweetest and most acceptable music is that which rises from work a-doing. Its incense ascends as from the river in its flowing, from the wind in its blowing, from the grass in its growing. All at once he heard the voices of two women in the next garden close behind him, talking together. Eh, said one, there's that godless creature, Andrew Comyn, at his work again upon the Sabbath morning. Ay, lass, answered the other, I hear him. Eh, but it'll be an ill day for him when he has to appear before the judge of all. He wanna have his commandments broken that gate. Truth na, returned the former, it'll be a sair settling day for him. Donal rose, and looking about him, saw two decent, elderly women on the other side of the low stone wall. He was approaching them with a request on his lips to know which of the Lord's commandments they supposed the cobbler to be breaking, when, seeing that he must have overheard them, they turned their backs and walked away. And now his hostess, having discovered he was in the garden, came to call him to breakfast, the simplest of meals, 
porridge, with a cup of tea after, because it was Sunday, and there was danger of sleepiness at the kirk. "'Your shoon's waitin' you, sir,' said the cobbler. "'You'll find them a better job nor you expected. "'They're a better job any gate nor I expected.' Thunnel made haste to put them on, and felt dressed for the Sunday. "'Are you going to the kirk the day, Anru?' asked the old woman, adding, as she turned to their guest, "'My man's rather peculiar about going to the kirk. "'Some days he'll gang three times, and some days he went again once. "'He kens himsel' what for,' she added with a smile, "'whose sweetness confessed that, whatever was the reason, "'it was to her the best in the world. "'I am going the day. "'I want to gang with our new friend,' he answered. "'I'll take him, gin ye dinna care to gang,' rejoined his wife. "'Oh, I'll gang,' he persisted. "'It will give us something to talk about, "'and so ken one another better.' and maybe come a bit nearer one another, and saw a bit nearer the maister. That's what we're here for, coming and going. As you please, Anru. What's right to you is I right to me. On my own self I would be doubtful a such a reason for going to the kirk, to get something to speak about. It's a good reason, where you have not a better, he answered. It's often I get at the kirk nothing but what angers me. Lays and lies again my lord and my god. But when there's one to talk it o'er with, one that has some care for God as well as for himself, there's some good sure to come out of it. Some revelation of the real righteousness. Now what folk get gangs by the minister's cause righteousness. Is your shoon comfortable to your feet, sir? Aye, that they are. And I thank ye. They're full better nor new. Well, we winna have worship this morning. When ye gang to the kirk, it's like eatin' mare nor's good for ye. Who tanneru? Ye dinna think a body can have ore muckle o' the word? Said his wife, anxious as to the impression he might make on Donal. Oh, na. Nah. Can a body take it in and digest it? But it's not a bonny thing to have the words sticking about your mouth and bagging out your poaches, not to say lying cold upon your stomach, and it for the life of men. The less you take upon what you put in practice, the better, and gin the thing said had nothing to do with practice, the less ye heed it, the better. Gin ye had done your breakfast, sir, we'll gang. Not at its freely kirk time yet, but the Sabbath's most the only day I get a bit of a walk. "'and gin ye have no objection till a turn about the Lord's muckle house "'afore we gang into his little one. "'We call it his, but I doubt it. "'I'll be ready in a minute.' "'Donal willingly agreed, "'and the cobbler, already clothed in part of his Sunday best, "'a pair of corduroy trousers of a mouse colour, "'having endued an ancient tail-coat of blue with gilt buttons, "'they set out together, "'and for their conversation it was just the same "'as it would have been any other day. "'Where every day is not the Lord's, "'the Sunday is his least of all.' They left the town, and were soon walking in meadows through which ran a clear river, shining and speedy in the morning sun. Its banks were largely used for bleaching, and the long lines of white in the lovely green of the natural grass were pleasant both to eye and mind. All about, the rooks were feeding in peace, knowing their freedom that day from the persecution to which, like all other doers of good, they are in general exposed. Beyond the stream lay a level plain stretching towards the sea, divided into numberless fields and dotted with farmhouses and hamlets. On the side where the friends were walking, the ground was more broken, rising in places into small hills, many of them wooded. Half a mile away was one of a conical shape, on whose top towered a castle. Old and grey and sullen, it lifted itself from the foliage around it like a great rock from a summer sea, and stood out against the clear blue sky of the June morning. The hill was covered with wood, mostly rather young, but at the bottom were some ancient firs and beeches. At the top, round the base of the castle, the trees were chiefly delicate birches with moonlight skin, and feathery larches not thriving over well. "'What call they yon castle?' questioned Donal. "'It maun be a place of some importance.' "'They mostly call it just the castle,' answered the cobbler. "'It's old name's Graham's Grip. "'It's Lord Morven's place, and they call it Castle Graham. "'The family name's Graham, you ken.' They call themselves Graham Graham, just two ways of spelling the name putting together. The last lord, not upon the main branch, they tell me, spelled his name with a diphthong, and wasn't a-willing to give it up altogether. So took the two of them. Yon's where a young Eppie's at service. And that minds me, sir, ye ha' not tell me yet what kind of a place ye would have yourself. It's not at a poor body like me can help, but it's I will to let folk ken what you're after. A word gang spearin' long after it's out o' sight, and the answer may come from far. The Lord Wiles brings about things in the most unlikely fashion. "'I'm ready for anything I'm fit to do,' said Donal. "'But I ha' had what's called a good education, 
though I had learned more from my own needs than for all my books. So I would rather till the human than the earthly soil, taking more interest in the schoolmaster's crops than in the farmer's. What ye object to master one by himself, or maybe two? Na, surely. Can I saw myself fit? Eppy mentioned last night that there was word about the castle of a tutor for the youngest. Have ye any way of approaching the place? Not till the minister comes home, answered Donal. I have a letter to him. He'll be back by the middle of the week, I hear them say. Can ye tell me anything about the people at the castle? asked Donal. A good, answered Andrew. But some things is better found out nor can beforehand. Ilka place has its own shape, and most things has to have some parent to guard them fit. That's what I tell young Eppy, many's the time. Here came a pause, and when Andrew spoke again it seemed on a new line. Did it ever occur to you, sir, he said, that maybe death might be the first waken to some folk? It has occurred to me, answered Donal, but many things come into the body's head that he's not able to think out. They maun lie and bide their time. Let none of the lovers of law and letter persuade ye the Lord wadna have ye think, though none but him it obeys can think with safety. We maun do first the thing that we can, and sin we may think about the thing that we dinna can. I fancy at whiles the Lord would not say a thing, just not to stop folk thinking about it. He was aye at getting them to make use of the candle of the Lord. It's my belief the main obstacles to the growth of the kingdom are first the unbelief of believers and sain the way that they lay down the law. Afore they alert the rudiments to the truth themselves, they begin to lay the grievous burden of their dullness and ill-conceived notions of holy things upon the minds and consciences of their neighbours. Fain you would think to hold them from growing any mer nor themselves. Eh, man, but the Lord's wonderful. Ye may dare and dare, and not come in sight of him. The church stood a little way out of the town, in a churchyard overgrown with grass, which the wind blew like a field of corn. Many of the stones were out of sight in it. The church, a relic of old Catholic days, rose out of it like one that had taken to growing and so got the better of his ills. They walked into the musty, dingy, brown-atmosphered house. The cobbler led the way to a humble place behind a pillar. There Doherty was seated, waiting them. The service was not so dreary to Donal as usual. The sermon had some thought in it, and his heart was drawn to a man who would say he did not understand. "'Yon was a fine discourse,' remarked the cobbler as they went homeward. Donal saw nothing fine in it, but his experience was not so wide as the cobbler's. To him the discourse had hinted many things which had not occurred to Donal. Some people demand from the householder none but new things, others none but old, whereas we need in truth of all the sorts in his treasury. "'I had not a doubt it was all right, and as you say, Andrew,' said his wife, "'but for myself I could make neither head nor tail of it.' "'I said not, Dory, it was all right,' returned her husband. "'That would be to say a heap for anything human. "'But it was a good, honest sermon.' "'What was yon he said about the miracles not being types?' asked his wife. "'It was God's truth, that,' he said. "'Give me a share of the same, I beg of ye, Andrew Coleman.' "'What the man said was this. "'At the sea it Peter got out upon, "'was not first and foremost to be looked upon "'as a type of the inward and spiritual troubles of the believer.' still less the troubles of the church of Christ. The Lord deals with facts, none the less, that they cannot help being types. Here was terrible facts to Peter. Here was angry water and roaring wind. Here was danger and fear. The man had to trust or gang down. Gin the house be on fire, we maun trust. Gin the water gang o'er our heads, we maun trust. Gin the horse run away, we maun trust. Him it cannot trust in sick-like conditions, I would not give a plaque for any other kind of faith he may have. God's not a mere thought in the world of thought, but a living power in all worlds alike. Him it gangs to God with a sair head will the sooner gang to him with a sair heart. And them it thinks not he cares for the pains of their bodies will ill believe he cares for the doubts and perplexities of their inquiring spirits. To my mind he spake the best of sense. I didn't hear him say anything like that, said Donal. Did you know? Well, I thought it came from him to me. Maybe I wasn't again the best heed, said Donal. But what you say is as true as the sun. It stands to reason. The day passed in pleasure and quiet. Donal had found another father and mother. End of chapter 7
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 8 The Gate. The next day after breakfast, Donal said to his host, "'No, I mun pay ye for my shoon, for again I dinna pay at once I cannot tell how muckle to call my in, and what I had to gang by till I get more.' "'Na, na,' returned the cobbler. "'There's just one prejudice I ha' left concerning the Sabbath day. I firmly believe it a prejudice, for siller's the Lord's due, but I cannot win o'er it. I cannot bring myself to take siller for any work done upon it. So ye mun just be content to let that flay stick to the Lord's wall. You'll do his muckle for me some day.' "'There is nothing left me but to thank ye,' said Donal. "'There's the lodging and the board, though. "'I mun ken about them afore we gang farther.' "'They're none of my business,' replied Andrew. "'I leave all that to the good wife, and I counsel ye to do the same. "'She's a capital manager, and winna charge ye o'er muckle.' Donal could but yield, and presently went out for a stroll. He wandered along the bank of the river till he came to the foot of the hill on which stood the castle. Seeing a gate, he approached it and finding it open, went in. A slow ascending drive went through the trees, round and round the hill. He followed it a little way. An aromatic air now blew and now paused as he went. The trees seemed climbing up to attack the fortress above, which he could not see. When he had gone a few yards out of sight of the gate, he threw himself down among them and fell into a reverie. The ancient time arose before him, when, without a tree to cover the approach of an enemy, the castle rose defiant and bare in its strength, like an athlete stripped for the fight, and the little town huddled close under its protection. What wars had there blustered, what rumors blown, what fears whispered, what sorrows moaned? But were there not now just as many evils as then? Let the world improve as it may, the deeper ill only breaks out afresh in new forms. Time itself, the staring, vacant, unlovely time, is to many the one dread foe. Others have a house empty and garnished, in which neither love nor hope dwells, a self with no God to protect from it, a self unrulable, insatiable, makes of existence to some the hell called madness. Godless man is a horror of the unfinished, a hopeless necessity for the unattainable. The most discontented are those who have all the truthless heart desires. Thoughts like these were coming and going in Donald's brain, when he heard a slight sound somewhere near him, the lightest of sounds indeed, the turning of the leaf of a book. He raised his head and looked, but could see no one. At last, up through the tree boles on the slope of the hill, he caught the shine of something white. It was the hand that held an open book. He took it for the hand of a lady. The trunk of a large tree hid the reclining form. He would go back. There was the lovely cloth-striped meadow to lie in. He rose quietly, but not quietly enough to steal away. From behind the tree, a young man, rather tall and slender, rose and came towards him. Donal stood to receive him. "'I presume you are unaware that these grounds are not open to the public,' he said, not without a touch of haughtiness. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Donal. "'I found the gate open, and the shade of the trees was enticing.' "'It is of no consequence,' returned the youth, now with some condescension." "'Only my father is apt to be annoyed if he sees anyone.' He was interrupted by a cry from farther up the hill. "'Oh, there you are, Percy!' "'And there you are, Davy,' returned the youth kindly. A boy of about ten came towards them precipitately, jumping stumps and darting between stems. "'Take care, take care, Davy!' cried the other. "'You may slip on a root and fall.' "'Oh, I know better than that. "'But you are engaged.' "'Not in the least. Come along.' Donal lingered. The youth had not finished his speech. "'I went to Arky,' said the boy, "'but she couldn't help me. I can't make sense of this. I wouldn't care if it wasn't a story.' He had an old folio under one arm, with a finger of the other hand in its leaves. "'It is a curious taste for a child,' said the youth, turning to Donal, in whom he had recognized the peasant scholar. "'This little brother of mine reads all the dull old romances he can lay his hands on.' "'Perhaps,' suggested Donal, they are the only fictions within his reach. Could you not turn him loose upon Sir Walter Scott? A good suggestion, he answered, casting a keen glance at Donal. Will you let me look at the passage? said Donal to the boy, holding out his hand. 
The boy opened the book and gave it him. On the top of the page, Donal read, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. He had read of the book, but had never seen it. That's a grand book, he said. Horribly dreary, remarked the elder brother. The younger reached up and laid his finger on the page next him. There, sir, he said, that is the place. Do tell me what it means. I will try, answered Donal. I may not be able. He began to read at the top of the page. That's not the place, sir, said the boy. It is there. I must know something of what goes before it first, returned Donal. Oh, yes, sir. I see, he answered, and stood silent. He was a fair-haired boy, with ruddy cheeks and a healthy look, sweet-tempered, evidently. Donal presently saw both what the sentence meant and the cause of his difficulty. He explained the thing to him. "'Thank you! Thank you! Now I shall get on!' he cried, and ran up the hill. "'You seem to understand, boys,' said the brother. "'I have always had a sort of ambition to understand ignorance.' "'Understand ignorance. "'You know what queer shapes the shadows of the plainest things take. "'I never seem to understand anything till I understand its shadow.' "'The youth glanced keenly at Donal. "'I wish I had had a tutor like you,' he said. "'Why?' asked Donal. "'I should have done better.' "'Where do you live?' Donal told him he was lodging with Andrew Comyn, the cobbler. A silence followed. "'Good morning,' said the youth. "'Good morning, sir,' returned Donal, and went away. End of chapter 8「on Wednesday evening, Donal went to the Morven Arms to inquire for the third time if his box was come. The landlord said if a great heavy tool chest was the thing he expected, it had come. "'Donal Grant would be the name upon it,' said Donal. "'Deed, I didna look,' said the landlord. "'It's in the backyard.' As Donal went through the house to the yard, he passed the door of a room where some of the townsfolk sat, and heard the earl mentioned. He had not asked Andrew anything about the young man he had spoken with, for he understood that his host held himself not at liberty to talk about the family in which his granddaughter was a servant. But what was said in public he surely might hear. He requested the landlord to let him have a bottle of ale and went into the room and sat down. It was a decent parlour with a sanded floor. Those assembled were a mixed company from town and country, having a tumbler of whisky toddy together after the market. One of them was a stranger who had been receiving from the others various pieces of information concerning the town and its neighborhood. "'I mind the old man Whale,' a wrinkled, gray-haired man was saying as Donal entered. "'A very different man for this present. He would sit down as ready as no, that would he, with any poor body like myself, and give him his cracks, and hear his news, and drink his glass, and make nothing o't. But this man hath. Who ever saw him change word with brither man?' "'I never heard how he came to the title.' "'They say he was but some far-away cousin,' remarked a farmer-looking man, florid and stout. "'Hoots, he was ain brother to the last yearl. We write to the title, though none to the property. That he's but taken care of till his niece comes of age. He was a heap about the place afore his brother died, and they were friends as Wales brothers. They say at the Lady Arctura, hard ye ever sick a heathenish name for a lass, is born to marry the young lord. There's a sight of clapper clash about the place, and their folk and their strange ways.' They tell me none can be said to ken the yearl, but his own man. For myself I never came in their council, not even to the buying or selling o' a lamb. Well, said a fair haired, pale faced man, we ken for a scripture at the sins of the fathers is visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation, and who can tell? Who can tell? rejoined another, who had a judicial look about him, in spite of an unshaven beard, and a certain general disregard to appearances. Who can tell but the sins of our fathers may be lying upon some of ourselves at this very moment? In our case, I cannot see the thing would be fair, said a fifth. We dunna even ken what they did. We are not to interfere with the will of the Almighty, rejoined the former. It gangs its own gate, and mortal cannot tell what that gate is. His justice winna be countered. Donal felt that to be silent now would be to decline witnessing. 
He feared argument, lest he should fail and wrong the right, but he must not therefore hang back. He drew his chair towards the table. "'Would you let a stranger put in a word, friends?' he said. "'Oh, aye, and welcome. We set not up for the men at Gotham.' "'Well, I would spear a question, gin I may.' "'Spear away. Answer I went ensure said the man unshaven. "'Well, would you please tell me what you call the justice of God?' "'Anybody could tell you that. It consists in the punishment of sin. He gives ilk a sinner what his sin deserves.' "'That seems to me a uncle one-sighted definition of justice.' "'Well, what would ye make of it?' "'I would say justice means fair play. "'And the justice of God lies in this, "'at he gives ilk a man, beast, and devil fair play.' "'I'm doubtful about that,' said a drover-looking fellow. "'We maun gang by the word, "'and the word says he visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children "'to the third and fourth generation. "'I never could see the fair play of that.' "'Dinna ye meddle with things, John, that ye dinna understand. "'Ye may wake in the wrong box.' said the old man. "'I want to understand,' returned John. "'I'm not saying he disna do right. I'm only saying I canna see the fair play of it. It may well be right, and you no see it. I will that, but what for should I no say I dinna see it? Isna the blind man to say is blind?' This was unanswerable, and Donal again spoke. "'It seems to me,' he said, "'we need first to understand what's contained in the visiting of the sins of the fathers upon the children, afore we dar any judgment concerning it.' "'Aye, that's sense enough,' confessed a responsive murmur. "'I hadna seen muckle o' this world yet, compared wi' you, sirs,' Donal went on. "'But I have been a heap my lawn with nought and sheep, when a heap o' things go through my head, and I have seen something as weel, though no that muckle. "'I have seen a man, all his life afore a deuce honest man, come to the heap o' silver, and gang to the dogs.' A second murmur seemed to indicate corroboration. "'He got all to the dogs, as I say,' continued Donal. "'and the bairns he left behind him when he died a drink "'came upon the Paris, "'or would a hungered but for some it kenned him "'when he was yet in honour and poverty. "'No, would you not say this was a visiting "'of the sins of the father upon the children?' "'Aye, doubtless. "'Well, when I heard last about them, "'they were all like enough to turn out honest lads and lasses. "'Oh, I dare say. "'And what might you think the probability "'gin they had come into the lot of siller when their father died?' "'Maybe they might a gone the same gate he gaed. Was there injustice, then, or was there favour in that visiting of the sins of their father upon them? There was no answer. The toddy went down their throats, and the smoke came out of their mouths, but no one dared acknowledge it might be a good thing to be born poor instead of rich. So entirely was the subject dropped, that Donal feared he had failed to make himself understood. He did not know the general objection to talking of things on eternal principles. We set up for judges of right, while our very selves are wrong. He saw that he had cast a wet blanket over the company, and judged it better to take his leave. Borrowing a wheelbarrow, he trundled his chest home, and unpacking it in the archway, carried his books and clothes to his room. End of chapter 9《Chapter 10 of Donal Grant》this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 10. The Parish Clergyman. The next day, Donald put on his best coat and went to call on the minister. Shown into the study, he saw seated there the man he had met on his first day's journey, the same who had parted from him in such displeasure. He presented his letter. Mr. Carmichael gave him a keen glance, but uttered no word until he had read it. "'Well, young man,' he said, looking up at him with concentrated severity, "'what would you have me do?' "'Tell me of any situation you may happen to know or hear of, sir,' said Donal. "'That is all I could expect.' All repeated the clergyman, with something very like a sneer. But what if I think that all a very great deal? What if I imagine myself set in charge over young minds and hearts? What if I know you better than the good man whose friendship for your parents gives him a kind interest in you? You little thought how you were undermining your prospects last Friday. My old friend would scarcely have me welcome to my parish, one he may be glad to see out of his own. You can go to the kitchen and have your dinner. I have no desire to render evil for evil. "'but I will not bid you Godspeed. 
and the sooner you take yourself out of this young man, the better. Good morning, sir, said Donal, and left the room. On the doorstep he met a youth he had known by sight at the university. It was the minister's son, the worst behaved of all the students. Was this a case of the sins of the father being visited on the child? Does God never visit the virtues of the father on the child? A little ruffled, and not a little disappointed, Donal walked away. Almost unconsciously he took the road to the castle, and coming to the gate, leaned on the top bar and stood thinking. Suddenly, down through the trees came Davy bounding, pushed his hand through between the bars, and shook hands with him. "'I have been looking for you all day,' he said. "'Why?' asked Donal. "'Forgoo sent you a letter.' "'I have had no letter. Eppy took it this morning.' "'Ah, that explains. I have not been home since breakfast. "'It was to say my father would like to see you. "'I will go and get it. Then I shall know what to do.' "'Why do you live there? The cobbler is a dirty little man. Your clothes will smell of leather.' "'He is not dirty,' said Donal. "'His hands do get dirty, very dirty with his work, and his face, too, and I dare say soap and water can't get them quite clean. But he will have a nice earth bath one day, and that will take all the dirt off. And if you could see his soul, that is as clean as clean can be, so clean it is quite shining.' "'Have you seen it?' said the boy, looking up at Donal, unsure whether he was making game of him or meaning something very serious. "'I have had a glimpse or two of it, I never saw a cleaner. You know, my dear boy, there's a cleanness much deeper than the skin. I know, said Davy, but stared as if he wondered he would speak of such things. Donal returned his gaze. Out of the fullness of his heart his eyes shone. Davy was reassured. Can you ride? he asked. Yes, a little. Who taught you? An old mare I was fond of. Ah, you are making game of me. I do not like to be made game of, said Davy, and turned away. "'No, indeed,' replied Donal. "'I never make game of anybody. "'But now I will go and find the letter.' "'I would go with you,' said the boy. "'But my father will not let me be on the grounds. "'I don't know why.' "'Donal hastened home, and found himself eagerly expected, "'for the letter young Eppie had brought was from the Earl. "'It informed Donal that it would give his lordship pleasure to see him "'if he would favour him with a call. "'In a few minutes he was again on the road to the castle. "'End of chapter 10《ハプター11のドナル・グラント》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 11 The Earl. He met no one on his way from the gate up through the wood. He ascended the hill with its dark ascending firs. To its crown of silvery birches, above which, as often as the slowly circling road brought him to the other side, he saw rise like a helmet the grey mass of the fortress. Turret and tower, pinnacle and battlement appeared and disappeared as he climbed. Not until at last he stood almost on the top, and from an open space beheld nearly the whole front, could he tell what it was like. It was a grand pile, but looked a gloomy one to live in. He stood on a broad grassy platform, from which rose a gravelled terrace, and from the terrace the castle. He ran his eye along the front, seeking a door, but saw none. Ascending the terrace by a broad flight of steps, he approached a deep recess in the front, where two portions of the house of differing date nearly met. Inside this recess he found a rather small door, flush with the wall, thickly studded and plated with iron, surmounted by the Morven horses carved in grey stone, and surrounded with several mouldings. Looking for some means of announcing his presence, he saw a handle at the end of a rod of iron, and pulled, but heard nothing. The sound of the bell was smothered in a wilderness of stone walls. By and by, however, appeared an old servant, bowed and slow, with plentiful hair white as wool, and a mingled look of childishness and caution in his wrinkled countenance. "'The Earl wants to see me,' said Donal. "'What name?' said the man. "'Donal Grant, but his lordship will be nothing the wiser, I suspect. I don't think he knows my name. Tell him the young man he sent for to Andrew Comans. The man left him, and Donal began to look about him. The place where he stood was a mere entry, a cell in huge walls, with a second, a low, round-headed door, like the entrance to a prison by which the butler had disappeared. 
There was nothing but bare stone around him, with again the Morven arms cut deep into it on one side. The ceiling was neither vaulted nor groined nor flat, but seemed determined by the accidental concurrence of ends of stone stairs and corners of floors on different levels. It was full ten minutes before the man returned and requested him to follow him. Immediately Donal found himself in a larger and less irregular stone case, adorned with heads and horns and skins of animals. Crossing this, the man opened a door covered with red cloth, which looked strange in the midst of the cold, hard stone, and Donal entered an octagonal space, its doors of dark shining oak, with carved stone lintels and doorposts, and its walls adorned with arms and armor almost to the domed ceiling. Into it, as if it descended suddenly out of some far height, but dropping at last like a gently alighting bird, came the end of a turnpike stair, of slow sweep and enormous diameter, such a stair as in wildest Gothic tale he had never imagined. Like the revolving center of a huge shell it went up out of sight, with plain promise of endless convolutions beyond. It was of ancient stone, but not worn as would have been a narrow stair. A great rope of silk, a modern addition, ran up along the wall for a handrail, and with slow-moving withered hand upon it, up the glorious ascent climbed the serving-man, suggesting to Donal's eye the crawling of an insect, to his heart the redemption of the sons of God. With the stair yet ascending above them as if it would never stop, the man paused upon a step no broader than the rest, and opening a door in the round of the well said, "'Mr. Grant, my lord,' and stood aside for Donal to enter. He found himself in the presence of a tall, bowed man, with a large-featured white face, thin and worn, and a deep sunken eye that gleamed with an unhealthy life. His hair was thin, but covered his head, and was only streaked with grey. His hands were long and thin and white. His feet in large shoes, looking the larger that they came out from narrow trousers, which were of shepherd tartan. His coat was of light blue, with a high collar of velvet, and much too wide for him. A black silk neckerchief tied carelessly about his throat, and a waistcoat of pineapple shawl stuff, completed his dress. On one long little finger shone a stone which Donal took for an emerald. He motioned his visitor to a seat, and went on writing, with a rudeness more like that of a successful contractor than a nobleman. But it gave Donal the advantage of becoming a little accustomed to his surroundings. The room was not large, was wainscoted, and had a good many things on the walls. Donal noted two or three riding whips, a fishing rod, several pairs of spurs, a sword with golden hilt, a strange-looking dagger like a flame of fire, one or two old engravings, and what seemed a plan of the estate. At the one window, small, with a stone mullion, the summer sun was streaming in. The earl sat in its flood, and in the heart of it seemed cold and bloodless. He looked about sixty years of age, and as if he rarely or never smiled. Donal tried to imagine what a smile would do for his face, but failed. He was not in the least awed by the presence of the great man. What is rank to the man who honors everything human? Has no desire to look what he is not. Has nothing to conceal and nothing to compass. Is fearful of no tomorrow and does not respect riches. Towards such ends of being, the tide of Donal's life was at least setting. So he sat neither fidgeting nor staring, but quietly taking things in. The earl raised himself, pushed his writing from him, turned towards him, and said with courtesy, "'Excuse me, Mr. Grant. I wish to talk to you with the ease of duty done.' More polite his address could not have been, but there was a something between him and Donal that was not to be passed, a nameless gulf of the negative. "'My time is at your lordship's service,' replied Donal, with the ease that comes of simplicity. "'You have probably guessed why I sent for you?' "'I have hoped, my lord.' There was something of old-world breeding about the lad that commended him to the earl. Such breeding is not rare among Celt-born peasants. "'My sons told me that they had met a young man in the grounds. "'For which I beg your lordship's pardon,' said Donal. "'I did not know the place was forbidden. "'I hope you will soon be familiar with it. "'I am glad of your mistake. "'From what they said, I supposed you might be a student in want of a situation, "'and I had been looking out for a young man to take charge of the boy. "'It seemed possible you might serve my purpose.' I do not question you can show yourself fit for such an office. I presume it would suit you. Do you believe yourself one to be so trusted? 
Donal had not a glimmer of false modesty. He answered immediately, I do, my lord. Tell me something of your history. Where were you born? What were your parents? Donal told him all he thought it of any consequence he should know. His lordship did not once interrupt him with question or remark. When he had ended, Well, he said, I like all you tell me. You have testimonials? I have from the professors, my lord, and one from the minister of the parish, who knew me before I went to college. I could get one from Mr. Sclater, too, whose church I attended while there. Show me what you have, said his lordship. Donal took the papers from the pocket-book his mother had made him, and handed them to him. The earl read them with some attention, returning each to him without remark as he finished it, only saying with the last, "'Quite satisfactory.' "'But,' said Donal, "'there is one thing I should be more at ease if I told your lordship. "'Mr. Carmichael, the minister of this parish, "'would tell you I was an atheist, or something very like it, "'therefore an altogether unsafe person. "'But he knows nothing of me.' "'On what grounds, then, would he say so?' asked the earl, "'showing not the least discomposure. "'I thought you were a stranger to this place.' "'Donal told him how they had met, what had passed between them, and how the minister had behaved in consequence. His lordship heard him gravely, was silent for a moment, and then said, "'Should Mr. Carmichael address me on the subject, which I do not think likely, he will find me already too much prejudiced in your favour. But I can imagine his mistaking your freedom of speech. You are scarcely prudent enough. Why say all you think?' "'I fear nothing, my lord.' The earl was silent. His grey face seemed to grow greyer, but it might be that just then the sun went under a cloud, and he was suddenly folded in shadow. After a moment he spoke again. "'I am quite satisfied with you so far, Mr. Grant, and as I should not like to employ you in direct opposition to Mr. Carmichael, not that I belong to his church, we will arrange matters before he can hear of the affair. What salary do you want?' Donal replied he would prefer leaving the salary to his lordship's judgment upon trial. "'I am not a wealthy man,' returned his lordship, "'and would prefer an understanding. "'Try me, then, for three months, my lord. "'Give me my board and lodging, the use of your library, "'and at the end of the quarter a ten-pound note. "'By that time you will be able to tell whether I suit you.' "'The earl nodded agreement, and Donal rose at once. "'With a heart full of thankfulness and hope, "'he walked back to his friends. "'He had before him pleasant work, "'plenty of time and book help, "'an abode full of interest,' "'and something for his labour. "'Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee,' said the cobbler, "'rejoicing against the minister. "'The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain.' "'In the afternoon, Donal went into the town "'to get some trifles he wanted before going to the castle. "'As he turned to the door of a draper's shop, "'he saw at the counter the minister talking to him. "'He would rather have gone elsewhere, "'but for unwillingness to turn his back on anything. "'He went in. Beside the minister stood a young lady, who, having completed her purchases, was listening to their conversation. The draper looked up as he entered. A glance passed between him and the minister. He came to Donal, and having heard what he wanted, left him, went back to the minister, and took no more notice of him. Donal found it awkward, and left the shop. "'High and mighty,' said the draper, annoyed at losing the customer to whose dispraise he had been listening." "'Far beyond dissent, John,' said the minister, pursuing a remark. "'Doubtless, sir, it is that,' answered the draper. "'I'm thankful to say I never harboured a doubt myself, "'but I took what I was told on the argle-bargle. "'What how we suck as yourself said o'er us for? "'Can it be not to hold us in the straight path "'of what we're to believe and not to believe? "'It's a fine thing not to be accountable.' "'The minister was an honest man "'so far as he knew himself and honesty, "'and did not relish this form of submission.' But he did not ask himself where was the difference between accepting the word of man and accepting man's explanation of the word of God. He took a huge pinch from his black snuff-box and held his peace. In the evening Donal would settle his account with Mistress Comyn. He found her demand so much less than he had expected that he expostulated. She was firm, however, and assured him she had gained, not lost. As he was putting up his things, "'Leave a book or two, sir,' she said, when you look in, the place may look home-like. We shall call the room yours. Come as often as you can. It does my Anneroo's heart good to have a crack with one at ken something o' what the master would be at. Many one'll call him lord, but few will take the trouble to ken what he would have o' them. But there's my Anneroo. He'll sit yonder at his work, thinking by the oar the gether, or something the master said it he cannot win a thrights of. 
"'Depend upon it,' he says, Wiles. "'Depend upon it, lass. "'What anything he says does no look right to us. "'It maun be it we hadn't won at it.' "'As she ended, her husband came in "'and took up what he fancied the thread of the dialogue. "'And what are we to think of the man?' he said. "'It's content not to understand what he was at the trouble to say. "'Would he say things that he didn't mean folk to understand when he said them?' "'Weel, Anru,' said his wife. "'There's money a thing he said it I cannot understand. "'Neither am I muckle the better for your explaining of the same. "'I maun just let it sit.' "'Andrew laughed his quiet, pleased laugh. "'Weel, lass,' he said, "'the doing o' one thing's better nor the understanding o' twenty. "'Nor will ye be long on understand muckle it's dark to ye now, "'for the maister likes none but the doer o' the word, "'and her he likes well. "'Be blithe, lass. "'You sa have your fill o' understanding yet.' "'I'm fain to believe ye speak the truth, Anru.' It's great truth, said Donal. End of chapter 11